Welcome to the freshman presentation for Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Uh, with me today is Linda Sperling. Uh, she is our admissions specialist, and I'm Jeremy Sugar, the director of admissions at TJ. Uh, today, what we would like to share with you is some information about the application process. Uh, so we'll talk about the overview of TJ, the admissions, steps for application, how to complete the application, the selection process, and provide you some calendar of events so that that way you'll know when uh, certain important information. And finally, we'll close with some um, commonly asked questions that we get uh, or FAQs. Linda? Yes, let's talk about TJ's mission statement. There are three facets to it that we focus on when we talk to all of our students. First of all, to provide a challenging learning environment for all students, to inspire joy at the prospect of discovery, and to foster a culture of innovation based on ethical behavior and shared interests of humanity. TJ is located just off of 495 and Little River Turnpike. The address is actually on Braddock Road in Fairfax County. As you can see from the map, the jurisdictions, outlying jurisdictions of Loudoun County and Prince William County are to the west and the south. So it gives you a general idea of the, of the location. What makes TJ different? TJ is a regional governor school. What that means is the students apply uh, through an admissions process. All courses are taught in an honors AP or post AP level. And there's a focus on research-based learning beginning in ninth grade and connectivity between classes. So for example, the core group of subjects for ninth grader is in a group called IBEST, Integrated Biology, English, Statistics, and Technology. Three of those classes, the Biology, English, and Technology, are in a cluster of um, block schedule. So what that allows is flexibility for those uh, teachers to use extended time, for example, to take a field trip. So you're not infringing upon time of your other classes in your schedule but it creates that opportunity that you don't find at other schools. In the, the picture, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, there is a student out most likely with the biology class taking some samples. And on the right-hand side are the, some of the robots that the students develop, create the whole, from the circuitry to the actual building of it in the technology class. The research-based learning continues uh, for the sophomores and juniors. They have two classes that are connected that allows for that continued um, flexibility. And once at the end of the junior year, the students will select a topic for their senior research project. TJ is fortunate to have on site um, an array of labs, as you will see. Most of the students, when they pick their research topic, um, it will fall within the, the boundaries of one of those laboratories. However, they also have a mentorship program that allows for a student to go outside the boundaries of one of the labs within the school, and they can meet at or representatives from these mentorship business partners will come in and assist the student with their project during their senior year. It's truly one of the remarkable hallmarks of TJ. TJ is more than just research-based learning. Uh, it, is a, it offers a full curriculum and a complete high school curriculum as a public school in the state of Virginia. And so students are going to receive the same courses that you would at any other public high school. They're going to receive your English classes, your history classes. Clearly your math and science are critical and important to what we're, we're offering at TJ. But we will offer a wide range of elective courses, whether that is world language classes or elective classes, not all of which have to uh, be STEM related. Uh, however, one of the unique pieces that we offer uh, at TJ, uh, and it's truly a phenomenal unique piece that, that I think that the school provides to our students is what's known as eighth period. We function on an eight period cycle, uh, and this class meets twice a week it's the last period of the day on Wednesdays and Fridays, and this is our activities uh, period for our students. What they're able to do is a wide variety of different clubs and activities during the school day. Previously, you saw the map that Linda was speaking about in terms of where the students are coming from. We recognize that students 
if they're riding on the bus or even just traveling by car, that may be a, a great distance for a large number of our students. And staying after school might not be an option for everyone. And so one of the things that we wanted to provide is an opportunity to still be able to be involved with all those different clubs and activities. And so whether that would be Model UN or some type of dance club or even an electronics club or tutoring or any of those types of things, there are over 150 different clubs and activities that are available for the students uh, to be able to enjoy. And it may even be one of those things where students are able to go from one to another even within a, a single day or it might meet multiple different times. We also offer extracurriculars. Uh, and this is for those students who still enjoy and want to be able to play sports or be a part of the fine and performing arts. Uh, all of the same school activities that you would have as an extracurricular activity at any of the other schools in Fairfax County, whether that's playing basketball or playing football in the fall or running track or swim or any of those things throughout the school from a sports standpoint is available to you. So you're not putting that aside and not giving that up by attending TJ. One of the things that we are really looking for as we get into the application is what type of student are you? We want to see evidence of academic achievement. We want to see evidence of genuine interest, curiosity, creativity, and STEM. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is, and, and I think what's really important is, if you look at the questions here on the slide, is that what are, what are you interested in about STEM and why? What have you done to pursue that interest? What do you want to do in the future? What would you hope to learn? Why TJ? So parents, as you're watching this with your son or daughter, these are great questions to be able to have uh, with your son or daughter and have them answer the question of why do they want to go to TJ? What is it that excites them and interests them? What I would like to move on to is allowing Linda to share some more information about the eligibility requirements and what it would allow you to be able to apply and ultimately attend TJ. Linda? As we were talking about a little earlier on the what makes TJ different, the eligibility requirements. So you will be in eighth grade to apply to ninth grade. You must be a resident in one of the five participating jurisdictions. You must be enrolled in Honors Algebra One or higher in eighth grade. And you also must be taking Honors Science and one additional Honors course. The GPA requirement is 3.5, and this is for the end of seventh grade in your four core subjects, unless you're taking a world language in seventh grade, that's a high school credit, it would be five. And then first quarter, eighth grade for those same four or five core subjects for first quarter only. These grades are unweighted, so if you're taking a course in middle school that has an extra credit, that will move to the high school transcript, but it's not considered a part of our process because not all of our schools, and we work with around 120, have opportunities for their students to take honors level courses. Now, needless to say, I'm not going to read this to you, the previous slide really outlined the requirements for FCPS students. For all of our other participating jurisdictions, you will find the information on this slide that pertains exactly to you. So I encourage you when you're watching this video to stop and read this closely because all of our jurisdictions don't offer all honors courses or specific honors courses. We want to make sure that you know this is the place to go to verify that you are enrolled in the proper courses for your particular jurisdiction. Now, we, we are getting ready to start the application process. So this is the website you will find. You're going to scroll down the page and you're going to come to the freshman application process there. And once you click on that, you will come down to the steps for the application. They're really very simple. And we really strongly urge the parents and the students to read these steps before they begin the process. The very first step is, is very important. The applicant must begin the process. 
And what happens is they will fill out very basic uh, demographic information. Um, when they get to the bottom of that first screen, they're going to save. What happens when they hit that save button is, first of all, an email will go to the parent that they've designated as the sponsoring parent, and that will contain the link for them to create their login. The second thing that will happen is their name, the student's name, will appear on our school contact list for their particular middle school. All of our middle schools that we deal with, public and private, and even homeschool students, they have a contact person who will verify the math. We don't have that information, so that's why they're so important to us. Now, what, what you need to remember is these school contacts have taken on this role as an additional responsibility. So we give them up to 48 hours to go into their school contact list and verify that math. So here again, and it doesn't count if you start on a Friday afternoon, those, that 48 hours doesn't begin until Monday. So remember that as you're working through this process. And once that math has been verified, then an auto-generated email will go out telling you that in fact it has been verified and you may move forward with the, with the process. So once you've received that email, um, also that email is going to be recorded um, in the application, there's going to be a spot called the Correspondence tab. Go to that Correspondence tab. It will contain all of the auto-generated or emails that we have created to send to you. So you never have to be concerned as to whether or not you received an email. There's a place where they're all located. So once you've logged back in, both the parent and the applicant will need to electronically sign. If you are before you submit that application, parents, if you have a student who has testing accommodations, you will need to go to the additional form, forms tab within the application and complete any uh, testing, the testing requirements form and upload either your IP or 504 for your student so that we can go over that and reach back out to you to make sure that your student receives the accommodation um, that they require um, and should have. Um, once it's submitted, then here again, you're going back to that correspondence tab and you'll see that, that email. Um, also, as noted here, the, uh, there, you're in the admissions process. You've just completed the application. However, we're, we're going to be reaching out to you again, but there is a gap in time. So what we want you to, to be aware of is go to the calendar. It's on the website, but it's also in this presentation where you will see the dates where we will be determining um, if you've met all of the honors requirements and we'll be notifying families that may not have the GPA that's required. We just want you to know that that is there so you can monitor as everything is, how everything is moving along. So what you're seeing here is an image that's on our freshman application page. Uh, above this, and this is what Linda was referencing when you are logging on to our website. So at the top of the page for the freshman, you will see an image with uh, the students. Um, Partway down the screen was the steps to complete that Linda just walked you through. Uh, and right below that is actually the link to click to start the application process you would actually click on where it said applicant portal. Once you open that up or you go to the next page, you're going to see the very first screen of the application. Once again, this is really completed by the student. The parents or the guardians, you can certainly be standing right there side by side and help them walk through this process, but we do want the students to complete it. You're going to select one of these options. As a student, you're going to select, I'm the student. Once you do that and you move forward to the next page, you're going to come to the actual login for the applicant portal. Now it's really important for you to understand what this information is asking you. For our Fairfax County public school students, you're going to use your FCPS ID, your username, which is what you're logging into your computers currently, and password to enter into the system. It's all seamlessly included and synchronized between any of the other accounts. 
For all of our other students, whether you're in Fairfax or any of the other participating jurisdictions, whether you're public school or private school, it doesn't matter. We need you to create an applicant ID or a username. To do so, you're going to check the box above the login and follow the directions, entering in some basic information to identify and establish a username. Then you will come back with that username and log in under the username and the password that you've created. It's only a handful of steps, but it is important that you know that you have to create one for us. It's not the user ID that you use in your school system. Now, this is really important. The application deadline is Friday, November 17th, bef before 4 p.m. So we encourage you to not procrastinate this process. Once you have received the math approval verification, then it will take you very few minutes to complete it all. We encourage you to do that because the system will not allow anyone to submit once it hits 4 p.m. So this is really an important deadline. It's listed on the calendar. Um, and we just want you to know because we don't want you to miss this opportunity because you did not get it submitted. The administration components follow after the application is completed. Uh, this will take place later in the uh, in winter. Uh, once we've established uh, submitted applications and we've established that you've met the, the criteria for the GPA or the course requirements, uh, in January you'll receive information about the testing date, uh, which you'll see here on the screen. Uh, depending upon, as Linda spoke, uh, depending upon whether you need accommodations or, uh, or not, as Linda spoke previously, uh, might result in you uh, testing on an alternate test date. And that's totally fine. Uh, we have accommodations and, and all, we also have uh, students who may be sick or even students who have prearranged absences and need to test on the alternate date. So there's a few different reasons why we would test you uh, on a secondary date. And so please pay attention to those. Additionally, those dates will be emailed and referenced um, throughout the different courses and different time frames within the application process. There will be com uh, continual communication. There are gaps in time just because we're moving from one phase to the next, so we do want you to recognize that. Many times our students are going to ask us what is on the actual assessment and what do they have to do on those te test dates in, uh, in the winter time. And the first part of that is, is our uh, our student portrait sheet, which covers portrait of a graduate and 21st century skills. There are eight different categories of topics that we could ask questions of. However, we're only going to ask questions on four. So there will be four questions that the students need to respond to. Now these are all done on computer. Uh, this, the, each question has a character count of 1,500 characters. That does include spaces and punctuations and any type of characters that you happen to include as you're typing through letters and numbers, uh, obviously. Uh, and the following question is a problem-solving essay. So students are going to receive five questions. It is a timed assessment. You are able to allocate as much or as little time to each of those questions. The problem solving essay is a math or science based problem. We are looking for you to answer the problem and provide us information with how you answer that problem. What we want to do then afterwards is we'll evaluate all of your uh, application process. The evaluation process really looks at the following information. It's looking at that GPA. Uh, that we referenced in terms of meeting the, the application requirements of a minimum of a 3.5, but certainly we have many students that are above that through the, uh, up to the 4.0 GPA range. We're looking at your responses as a student to the student portrait sheet, those four questions, along with your response to the problem solving essay. Our evaluators go through and look at your responses to the questions that were asked. And it really is about your responses. There are some additional factors that are included and evaluate or calculated into the overall evaluation of your application, which includes for some students, if they're economically disadvantaged, if they're an English language learner, or, and I could also say and, 
if they're a student that is special education. So as we go through the evaluation phase, after the testing that we, is conducted in, uh, in the winter time, we go into um, the selection process. The selection process uh, is rather um, intricate and, and can be confusing. And so I wanna take just a moment to kind of speak a little bit about this. What we, when we go through this process uh, in terms of the seat allocation, we have what is known as allocated and unallocated seats. For our allocated seats, these are provided to our, our public schools. This is not only just Fairfax County. This is any of the public schools that we have that participate. So all of our other jurisdictions also have the same rules applied to them. What that means is, is we're looking at the total students uh, in eighth grade in each of these public schools. And what we're doing is we're, we're providing a percentage or a number of seats available to that school that is equal to 1.5% of their eighth grade student population. Now, whatever that number happens to be, uh, those are seats that we set aside for that particular school. The top performing students at their school, as long as they meet evaluation standards, will be offered up to the total number that is equivalent to the 1.5% of their eighth grade student population. And I know that gets a little confusing. We also have unallocated seats. Now the unallocated seats are what's available to any and all students. So what I mean by that is, is that there are a certain number of seats that we provide to a public school, but we also are able to provide more students than what's allocated to that. So a, you know, a certain public school may actually have more students that are offered admissions to TJ than what's allocated through, um, through that 1.5%. Additionally, our private school and even our homeschool students are also offered seats through our unallocated um, seat you know, process. Again, this is extremely confusing or it can be uh, extremely confusing. Um, it also goes in and is reintroduced as we go through our process that looks at our weight pool. And so there is timing and, uh, it, that comes and goes within each of these steps. And so that this is part of the reason why there is a, a little bit of a lag time between when we do the evaluation from testing and ultimately off, uh, offer it our, uh, or provide our offers and our opportunities for weight pool and, and so on. Uh, Linda, would you uh, like to um, just kind of share a little bit about the, the calendar of events? Yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to make sure that you're aware of once that application is submitted that while there's a wait period in there. We want you to, to know about it so you don't um, have concern that you've missed some communication of some sort. So you can see here that we've, we've published the opening time for the application. Um, there's also a data in there. The Wednesday prior to the application submission date is the last day that you can start a new application. And there's a purpose for that. At the very beginning, we talked about allowing those counselors up to 48 hours to approve an application. That is why you can't begin a new application after Wednesday preceding the submission date for, for having it finalized and, and turning it in. That's on the calendar. Then you'll notice we have there um, the date when we will notify families um, if they have not met the GPA requirement or the course requirement for their particular jurisdiction, school that they are attending. And then, of course, the writing administration dates, and then ultimately the release date when we will notify you. And by regulation, it has to be by the end of April. So there are a number of questions that we get throughout the process. Uh, and. Uh, we referenced a map in the early part of the, the process. Uh, Linda, can you share with, me, uh, with uh, the audience, what are the five participating jurisdictions? They are, of course, Fairfax, Arlington, Loudoun, Prince William counties, and then the city of Falls Church. 
So those are our five participating jurisdictions. And people will ask us, why is the city of Alexandria not included? Every year we send out invitations to all of the jurisdictions to renew their commitment to participate in the process. And one of the reasons City of Alexandria is not is because they have chosen, the school board for Alexandria has chosen not to allow their students to apply. So, uh, you know, we talked a lot about the, the application process, and I know we met, referenced multiple times about the students starting the application. And I, I want to reinforce that. Part of the reason for the students to do so is because there are actually two logins. There's a login for the student. There's a login created and generated for the parent as well. The student will continually use their login, whatever, whether that's the FCPS account that they have for the school system or it's the created account. They're going to use that when they take the testing in, in the wintertime. Uh, but they're also going to use that anytime they come in to check status of events, look at old emails, uh, any of those types of things that are actually occurring throughout that process. Because when we release decisions in the spring, whenever that is, I mean, uh, you know, prior to our, our deadline uh, is what we would hope for. Uh, but the other thing is, is that's where you'll find out how um, you have actually, you know, and I don't want to say how you perform, but I would say, you know, whether you're offered admissions and, and how you would go about accepting that offer or not. The other piece of this is, is that parents, with your account, you'll be able to see everything else that the student is able to see. So it's a mirrored account to what uh, your son or daughter is actually um, seeing. So tell me a little bit more about the problem solving essay and the portrait, uh, student portrait sheet. Um, in the application. Is this something that students have to worry about um, as they're filling the application in the fall? Is there any other information that they have to have? Or kind of what could they expect to kind of fill out for the application itself? Yes. Um, students will call and they'll want to know, you know, what do I need to know to do this? And as Jeremy covered earlier, we, we're giving you all eight of the characteristics that we will create prompts for, for the, the problem solving, for the student portrait sheet. And everything regarding the problem solving essay is based upon an, an eighth grade student who is enrolled in eighth grade algebra one and eighth grade science. So the students will know how to um, approach solving, whether it's a math or science problem solving essay, um, and attached to that writing administration, the families will say, so we have an hour and a half of time, unless you have extended time in the accommodation setting. I have an hour and a half. Is it broken down? Do I only have so much time for each prompt? No, you can use that hour and a half however it suits you. Do, and do, do they get any warnings or anything like that during oh, yes. the, the time frame? Yes, this is a proctored exam, and so the, the proctors will advise you when you're halfway through the testing window um, with five minutes remaining. And they will also remind you as they go along to check your character count so that you will be able to save what you're working on. There is a very explicit set of instructions during this writing administration, as we call it, and the whole purpose of that is to, to remove any concerns students have that they're, they're not getting enough warning to know when it's time to stop. Um, that's what those test administrators are there for, to help you in, in, the, in managing that time. Are they allowed to use a calculator on the, the math, the problem there's solving no essay? Calculators. Um, there's no calculators. There is no spell checker. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that you will be instructed is you absolutely shall not open another window because that could be cause for being dismissed from the testing, and we certainly don't want that. But we also tell you in the instructions that we are not concerned that you have spelled every word correctly. We're concerned that you can convey what you're writing to us from your personal perspective for the student portrait sheet prompts and for the problem solving essay that you can actually provide us whatever the, the question is asking for in the form of formulas or solutions that you're providing those in your words. 
if words are misspelled, as long as we can read what your thought is in that sentence or in that formula, that's what's important. So we want our students not to stress about the absolute perfection of spelling or, or the grammar, because that's not what we want you to be concerned about. So another thing that we sometimes get questions about is the GPA and the honors requirements. And so prior to, to these slides that you're seeing, we included the slide with a lot of detail. Uh, and I know Belinda mentioned that she was not going to read through it, but it really does get into um, the honors requirements from the courses. And we know that the different jurisdictions, the different schools and the different counties and, and the city of Falls Church, both public and private, have a variety of different course offerings that may be available to you. And that's not the same from school to school. So please look at those to determine and help yourself determine um, the course requirements as you go into eighth grade or as you're sitting in eighth grade. By all means, you certainly can reach out to us and ask us questions. Uh, are these the courses? Is this the proper course sequence? What information do we, uh, what other information do you maybe need from us? Um, I have questions about my GPA. Does this course count within the GPA? Uh, what is the GPA? Uh, and we use a straight line GPA. Uh, that information is located on our website as well. Uh, you can find more information out. Uh, we certainly recommend and encourage you go to the website for additional information. Looking at the important dates and deadlines are critical to make sure that you're able to proceed with the process. We are here to assist you and help you throughout this entire process. You also have a counselor at your school that is going to work with us, and they are a great wealth of information uh, and, and an ally um, to helping you through the application process. All right, so for any additional questions that you may have, please reach out to us via email at tjadmissions at fcps.edu, or you can call us at 571-423-3770. Once again, I'm Jeremy Sugar, the Director of Admissions with Linda Sperling, uh, our Admissions Specialist. Thank you very much and have a wonderful year.